Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. This time I get to host the beautiful Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa and Solutions with Aquarius Rising Africa. As always, if you are living under a rock and you haven't heard of this beautiful person, I will be placing the links to her channels down in the description box below. <laughs> go hit them. I said, go hit, go hit them a subscribe. Go <laughs> hit them a subscribe. Oh, it's been a long day. It's been a long day. We, we had enough hits for the past week. We've had a few hits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, so you guys, you might remember uh, they lost their original channel. So go make sure you are like following them because they have our friend They're Apart from the shadow work stuff we're going to talk about, uh, Shanti and Mornay really cover some hard topics um, very with, with, a, with a lot of grace over on their channel. And so, um, yeah, so go support them. And their Aquarius Rising Africa is more of, I would say, the the world news information, whereas the solutions yeah. is where, because Shanti is a lot like me for you guys who haven't um, seen us together yet, but uh, Shanti and I are both Aquarians. Uh, we're both yoga people and we're both O negative blood type. <laughs> so um, um, we're sisters from a different mister. Um, <laughs> so even though Shanti's an incredible interviewer, her real job is, 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 um, she ain't new to the shadow work stuff. She is not new and she facilitates, she helps facilitate healings now for people. And I was just telling Shanti that I just filmed day three's updates and Saturday, you guys are going to start to dive into sound bowl healing, which is something that Shanti uh, does. Um, I will link our last episode in the description box below where we talked a lot about that in case you missed it. Um, but first, before we get into more of mm -hmm. your story, Shanti, before we started filming, we have a pop in uh support group on signal don't we wow i've got to tell you i, I am amazed we were just having an uh, off-air chat now bryce and we were talking about all these incredible particularly women i can't say they're not men i've just you know the ones i've seen a woman yeah. that have joined this uh, shadow work challenge and i gotta tell you it's such a privilege to be part of that and thank you for setting that up i think it's such an incredible thing to do you know uh, we were actually and still are in the process of setting up fasts and things and you know we're doing three day five day fasts and stuff like that and the benefit of that so i think it's wonderful that all of us are, are pulling together and just the fact that there's more than 500 people that have signed up for this challenge i mean it's incredible well done I know. Guys. we're either geniuses or we're batshit crazy probably a little bit of both <laughs> <laughs> this is our tribe is our tribe we got it all of them we got it like, all of them all types all shapes all sizes it's, it ain't <laughs> all our first rodeo on mother earth and so we're like listen we got we we got to eventually figure this out and and i i know somebody emailed me they're like do you understand if 500 people are doing this each person doing this is going to affect their vibration is going to affect like more people around them and so that's exactly. why the gravity of 500 people is so huge all over the world because you helping yourself is literally helping the world exactly it's like lighting the candle you know when you light your candle or when you are that burning log is what i've always said so often i spoke i spoke about that in my talks and things you know when you yourself are that log that's a light and burning and fiery and passionate you know you have no option but to set those around you on fire yes and that's what happens and it's just such a beautiful time so Good. it really is it is the, the the birthing of the age of aquarius the beginning um and it's just amazing to you know i mean aquarian energies are complex to say the least you know i mean yeah. uh, you know we can we can look at it in its positive polarity because aquarius is the 11th sign of the zodiac <clears throat> and 11 is the first of the master numbers so it requires that if you look at it it's the two ones two legs it requires that you stand on your own two legs that you now stand up for yourself <clears throat> that you start walking your path, step ahead, you know, and step into your truth, step into your power. That's what the age of Aquarius is. And yes, um, and it's most definitely about technology and all these things as well as we're seeing. 
So, of course, there's the negative to every positive. And right. what we're seeing worldwide and globally right now is really the negative. It's the dark aspects of the Aquarian energy, which is all about this disconnectedness, mm -hmm. AI, um, no feeling, no nothing. Because Aquarians, we don't like to feel. And it's, no, 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 I'm, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm to gonna rephrase that. We definitely feel <clears throat> it's just very uncomfortable for us to express our emotions. So we tend to intellectualize our emotions. But the minute that we actually learn how to integrate that, and me being a double Aquarian and I've got a grand trine in air, you have to know it's all about mind, 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 not mind, mind. <laughs> and then, you know, and, and thinking, intellectualizing until I started teaching emotional work, you know. And for me, I got to tell you, one of the biggest leaps of faith I took, incidentally, is when I first started teaching the work I do. And I had my students work on me. And I said, okay, and they were terrified and I was terrified, <laughs> you know, because I knew they were going to pick stuff up. And I said, guys, don't hold back. I said, I don't want you to hold back. I said, this is going to be the most awesome experience for us all. And that taught me vulnerability and it taught me how to share and it taught me how to start expressing in a safe place as well. So it was really, I mean, it's just incredible. You know, the age of Aquarius is a beautiful time. We're waking up. It's about understanding. It's about uh, 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 integrating our emotions and, and along with technologies as well. Because one thing the Lucy's have done, and remember, it's not only the Lucy's. And remember, at the end of the day, the Lucy's are just got in inverted state. So <clears throat> they're very clever. They've created some marvelous things for us. So why not use it, but for the good and the benefit and not just for yeah. shitty things. Well, that's one thing when you do shadow work too, another aspect of shadow work that comes over time is you start to see the truth through the illusion. And when you're able to tap into the truth through the illusion, the net dark side of stuff doesn't become as powerful as it once was. And that's what I know my friend tomorrow in Australia did at the reading for November. And she talked about a lot of November is listening to your gut. Well, so many people in the world confuse their ego with their gut, their fear with their gut. But the more you do shadow work, the more you become, you come back in touch with that part yeah. of that knowing that gnosis part of you. And so there's so much unfolding. It's like, I know we've talked about this for Shanti for yoga, the Lotus flower is often the symbol one of the symbols for yoga and where does the lotus flower bloom on top of the shit basically the muck and it has to come through it to open up on top of exactly. it exactly <clears throat> but if you think about the lotus flower which in in eastern teachings and eastern philosophies it's the most sacred of the of all the flowers because it's really when you're looking at the chakra system and the seven main chakras each of them has a lotus with different number of petals until you reach the crown chakra, which is the thousand petal lotus, which is for consciousness. But it starts <clears throat> as a seed in the muddy waters of a pond, right? At the bottom of the pond. And <clears throat> it then starts blooming and it, or growing rather, sprouting. So it then has to fight its way through the mud, through the gunky waters. And remember, water is the emotional element. So, it, and it, those, those are symbolic of the lower three chakras, right? So we call them the lower triad. So when we are still stuck in our earthliness, we're stuck in the gunk, the mud, the swampiness, the sliminess, the addictions, the money, the fear, the all of this kind of stuff that keeps us back. So then, you know, when we grow through that and it's like we then, and, you know, the dirtier the water, very often the more beautiful because as the lotus grows through the water, it clears the water as it grows, grows up. So you can imagine as you grow, you're clearing, you're purifying your space and you're seeing clearly and then boom, you come up in the morning sun because that's when the lotus blooms is in the morning and boah, it opens up into full bloom as it meets the sun yeah. in full consciousness. And that's when we've understood our full journey. So it's like really understanding the human journey, journeying through the chakras, what each one has taught us because all the chakras are different ages in the body. 
And then you reach that place of <clears throat> enlightenment is not some airy-fairy notion. Really, it's not. It's a state of understanding. It's a state of having opened yourself up sufficiently within your being to receive light. Light is knowledge. That's what light is. That's simple, simply what it is. Light is knowledge. So as we have this knowledge filtering through, the intelligence of your body is going to translate what it says. And it translates it as a feeling and an emotion. And then you get to express that. But it's just such a beautiful thing, you know, and that's really what we learn when we go through the journey of the chakras and getting to understand who you are. And you can't reach that point within yourself unless you've dissolved those blockages. And that's what you're all doing here, which is such a beautiful thing. And that's in the body. I keep telling people that, you know, I think in the Western world too, we get so confused about spirituality. We think spirituality is channeling and talking to dead people and seeing spirits. No, spirituality is getting in touch with your own spirit. And that's yes, it's, absolutely. It's, it's in your fascia. It's Mary Magdalene says this. You have to descend. You have to descend mm. into yourself in order yeah. to then ascend. And so we have when pe- so when we talk about the body, we talk about this a lot, Shanti, about how the body is the shakti of the soul. This your yes. soul literally created your body so it can experience itself right Mm. and so all these aches and pains these bumps these bruises these dispositions that we think we've either inherited which you do have inherited karma are we it's just uh, it's it's puzzles that your soul created for you to then work through it and i know a lot of people who are very new to this in the group i i noticed there was some talks about like the side effects when you first start one is detoxing and the physical body will very physically start to detox when um, when you start on a very physical level. And I know if you've ever had a colonic, which colonics are where they literally flesh out your colon, it's one of the Kriyas. We have a better way of doing it in the modern times than they did in the ancient times. But, but I've had colonics before. And they'll literally tell you, now you're going to literally release, literally and figurative, figuratively release your shit. Yeah, Can absolutely. We talk about that for a moment because the stomach, you know, we think about nerves when we get nervous, we get butterflies in our stomach. The stomach has just as many like neuro pathways as the, as the brain does. That's why digestion issues can cause depression. And so the stomach is one of the, fir- and that's, that's the area, the physical area where we're finding that, that triad of the first three chakras. Yes. So can we talk about like, I know I've seen people, I mean, listen, this is why yoga people only hang out with yoga people because all they talk about are poops and periods because it becomes such a normal part of like detoxing <laughs> that you just get over it, you know? So that's normal, isn't it, Shanti, for people to have to go to the yeah. bathroom a lot for... Absolutely, absolutely. Abs- and it's releasing, <clears throat> you know, when you're looking at the body because remember every part of the body means something. So literally your colon would be literally letting go of your shit, okay? <laughs> literally. So, yes. So very often, uh, you know, always when people have colon issues um, or even digestive issues, okay, but let's talk specifically colon issues, invariably I will lay money on it that each and every one of you have an issue like that. You have a problem letting go. You hold on to stuff and you have no idea how to just let go and let God. Let's look at what letting go is. Okay. If you're holding on to something so tightly, right, whether it's something that you perceive to be good or bad, By holding on, you are not opening up your hand so that you can receive at the same time. Because remember, your hands are about giving and receiving. Think about, we've all heard that monkey and the monkey with his fist in the jar story, you know, trying to steal the monkey nuts and grabbing on and, you know, couldn't get anything at the end of the day, right? Yeah. So think about us as human beings and how we do that. When we hold on, if something is hurting you, if something doesn't serve you, if something is draining your energy, if something is taking up rent in your head and not paying for rent space, then you need to let it go. You know, you need to, it's like, as we were saying earlier on, 
it's like literally holding on to a hot coal with the intention of throwing that at someone and the only one who's getting burnt is you. Yeah. That's what we are doing. Think about that. Would you ever do that to yourself physically? No, no you wouldn't. So then let's just decide to let go and take 10 breaths when you decide to let go. Yeah. And every breath is a decision to let go. There's no thought in your head. You see what we as humans tend to do is we've got to think, well, how do I do that? I don't know why. And what must I do? And what's going to happen afterwards? And how am I going to? This is exactly the obstacles we've put in our way. You don't know. You don't need to know now how it's going to happen in a day or a month or a year from now. So many people stop themselves from joy because what happens if in two years' time, in six months, or next month I don't have any income, whatever, I'm going like, well, this is now. Yeah. So in this moment, decide to let it go. Decide to trust who you are. Decide to trust the voice that is within you. Yeah. Because that's going to take you on your next step, which takes you to your next step, which takes you to your next step. But you can't do that unless you've let go. Now, what I want to say by that as well, sorry, Bryce, and I'm taking up a lot of air no, time here. No, you go. <laughs> I brought you on for a reason. <laughs> and what I was saying is that letting go doesn't mean that you necessarily now have to say it's okay that someone harmed you. We're not saying that, okay? That's another, that's another step on the road to healing as we understand how we can unpack that and turn that around and turn that trauma or that really bad experience and turn it into a beautiful gift. You know, we were talking about the dark night of the soul and for me, I mean, I've definitely had some things go down in my life, for sure. I'm very grateful that I'm not one of those that has been violated and abused. And for that, I thank God every day. But I've certainly had my fair share of shit go down. And one of those very traumatizing moments was when my fiancé was killed in a hijacking that moment or a carjacking, that moment when you get that news, that moment when your world changes forever. Like that, yeah. And that for me, you see, that for me was my turning point. In South Africa, I could have become another statistic and angry and hateful and decided to leave the country and, you know, because it's just, yes, we have a country filled with crime. There's not even a question around that, okay? Um, but for me, I knew there was something so much deeper through all of this. Thank God for my sister who's a very uh, talented astrologer. <clears throat> and at the time she did my chart and she just said to me, you know that the spiritual gifts you're going to receive through this experience are beyond words, and as she looked. And I decided to embrace this experience as a gift from God. That doesn't mean that I didn't feel pain or I wasn't angry or I didn't lie in a fetal position some mornings and not want to move and have dreams and wake up only to find it was a dream. And that moment of reality hitting you, anyone who's lost someone who they've loved, and especially close to you, will understand what I'm talking about. But I knew that at that stage, you know, you know, Bryce, at that stage, I, I had a friend of mine, and I said to her, you know, I knew I always knew I was a healer, and I always knew I had to follow as this path at that stage i had sort of started doing things and you know doing courses on certain things and blah 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 um studying astrology was one of them <clears throat> and um 
I had no idea in which direction it was going to go, but that's, I knew that's the way I wanted to be. And this kind of showed me, and I knew that I had to do this. And it was like, if today was your last day on earth, what would you do? You know, for me, and that was why I took Hannes' death was the catalyst for that for me, because I knew that this was not in vain. Yeah. And every day I know it's not in vain. Every day I sit with people, I know that that experience has been the catalyst for this. Yeah. So I'm very grateful that he left for me. Hannes left for me. I saw that he didn't. What did you do to me and why did you leave me and what have you? I understood you left for me because I understand death is never about the ones that go, but always about the ones that are left behind. How do we deal with loss? Are we going to turn that loss into something that is so draining and that crushes your spirit? Or do you choose to see yourself as this beautiful shining light to this person that you love so much would only ever want the best for. And I knew in every cell of my being, he wanted to see me so happy. He wanted to see me succeed. He, want, <clears throat> he was there at the beginning of my spiritual journey, you know, when I started opening up. He was so encouraging of what I did. And after he crossed over, I, I still feel him. I know who he is in the spirit world. There's not even a question in my mind. And he shows me every day in little ways that he's around. And I know it's not a singular spirit anymore. It's a beautiful being and an energy that is completely integrated with my spirit, become one with God and our creator again, and flows through me in union with me if that makes sense. He was one of my strong soulmates. Um, I was very sad when he left. It took me a long time to recover, um, but I did it little bit by little bit. And that's when I started doing the healing work. People just came to me when I said, okay, I'm ready, God. This has shown me that I'm ready. And people just started coming to me. I never advertised ever. It was all word of mouth. Before I was full-time, I was a full-time healer and mentor, which was unheard of. I was completely paying my way. I was being invited to work in Namibia, Zambia, all over South Africa. Um, I was invited to go onto radio shows, television shows, um, and just share my story. And people found me, you know, and as long as that has happened, I understood that this was God's way of showing me I'm on the right path. Yeah. So, you know, something, and I know so many people have gone through bad things. And all I want to say is that these painful, traumatic situations are such blessings in disguise. If only you allow yourself just to see the gift in that experience. I went and I met the guy that killed him. I went to him. I sat with him across the table in his jail, in the jail cell, and I spoke to him. I tried to understand. I said, I'm trying to understand what happened. You know, I got some answers, but certainly not the ones I was requiring. I knew there was something a lot dodgier going on beneath the surfaces than what I was given. I knew it. Um, and then as I've also said to you before, maybe three or four months ago now, it, and this is like 25 years later, it came to my understanding and my attention that it was in fact a hit. He was taken out in a hit. And that for me was the closure of my wound that infected wound that wouldn't allow me to move forward in full love with anyone else. And because as long as I had not healed myself, as long as I was not moving forward in a healed way into other the relationships, the relationships I was attracting after that were never in their integrity. Yeah. That's so important. And, 
Yes. And I actually did a talk with Carmen Studer a couple of weeks ago about this uh, on, I think it was my show as well, where I spoke about that. And I spoke about that part of my heart that was still wounded. And obviously as energy put itself out, I attracted after that betrayal after betrayal until I got to the point where five years ago I went on my spiritual sabbatical. I gave in everything. I traveled to Thailand. I lived between Thailand and South Africa, sat with the monks in the temples. I just had the most incredible friendships with people. A very good friend of mine and I, we traveled together. He's a world class champion skydiver. So this beautiful, open-minded human being, and we just had such wonderful adventures together. Um, <clears throat> that was very healing for me to come back to the point where I could come back and get the closure I needed and realize through all of this, the betrayal I attracted was me not being in my truth. I was betraying me. I was, in fact, betraying them. If you think about it, I was not cheating on them. But they were living with a ghost of a man. How sad is that? Yeah. What, what you're saying is so important. I want, I want people to understand if you go through and just study all these different sages and these healers across the world, none of them have had easy lives. And that's what's important, though. That's, that's the gift. And that's like our friend Cindy says, without suffering, there would be no mystic. Because without suffering, we don't ask questions. If everything's easy, we're content. We have no need to figure things out. But when suffering hits you, and I've been there, I've, I think most people watching have been at that point where they don't think there's another rock bottom, that they're so broken that you don't think you can actually put those pieces back together. But then you start to, and you start to ask the questions and you look at the deeper, deeper meaning of life. You said you living with the ghost of a man that hit me hard. Like how many of us have been in that relationship where we expected our partners to be another person, or we were with someone who expected us to be another person. And that's, that's, but when we share these stories, I said on the day one catch up video, I talked a lot about the bar teacher people are working with, which is a woman named Marnie Alton that I really like because she talks so much about stuff we talk about in yoga, she brings it into the bar. And you see this woman and she's beautiful. She's gorgeous. She's got this beautiful body. I was listening to an interview once we talked, she's been in a very happy marriage for like 15 years, you know, and people look at her and think, oh, she, everything's so great for her. But in another interview, she goes through all of her struggles and all of everything she's been through. And, and so I think it's so important for us to share that side of, of what we've come through because it's necessary. The, yeah. the journey, it, it sounds cheesy to say it's never about the destination. It's always about that journey, about you. Mm. You know, I laugh a lot. Like, God really whipped my life in a very different direction there than it went where it was supposed to go, according to my how I was raised, you know. Um, and But it's all been necessary. And it's, it's the initiates. And Todd talks about this. It's the initiates journey. When you, when you have a powerful, per we all have powerful purposes in different ways, but if you are going to be the healer, if you are going to be the teacher, you can't do that until yeah. you experience, truly experience. And the universe is going to make sure that you really understand suffering yeah. before you're able to then put the hand out and help them out. When I say put the hand out and help somebody else, I don't mean you're doing it for them. Yeah, yeah. They, you absolutely. Can't. It's a support. The support. They've got to. They've got to take your hand, and you've got to say yes. Finally, let's go. Yeah, I was absolutely. saying yesterday, Shanti, as an Ashtanga teacher, like I was telling Emmy, like the hardest part of me as an Ashtanga teacher in the Mice Room is I often have to have a lot of tough love, and that's the hardest part for me. And I always say Shanti's the best at tough love because she's able to do tough love in such a loving way. And I think God really had fun with my soul or my soul had fun because I'm an Aquarius with a Scorpio moon. So my rising sign Super is Venus. Moon. <laughs> my, my rising sign or my, my birth sign is our very uh, detached Aquarian intellectual. <laughs> but the Scorpio in me is a hot mess all the time. 
I cry at everything. And so I miss that because the constant struggle within myself, like detaching, but also really get really caring, you know? So God's like, tee -hee -hee. and then my rising is Leo. So, you know, God was like, tee -hee -hee. Um, so. you know, it's so funny, but of course you got the rising Leo with the Aquarius sun. So really right there, you've got that opposition, right? In your, in your self versus your, let's say your persona, or your yep. mask, what you put out into the world, right? Well, of course, I'm the devil Aquarian who's like, devil brazen out there with a Libra moon. And the Aquarian goes, I don't give a shit what anyone thinks. And the Libra moon goes, but of course we do. We just do. <laughs> and the Aquarian son goes, no ways, go now. The Libra goes, are you sure? Are you sure you can <laughs> I so I told the story yesterday, Shanti, with Emmy, and this is such an Aquarian thing too. You know, in India we get groped, we get groped a lot. And I was talking about one time I got groped. I was walking home for practice, and I was so sweaty, I was so gross. The guy drove by on a scooter and grabbed my boob, and I didn't even react. I was like, "Well, that sucks for him. My boob's really sweaty anyway." Like. That's, I, but that's such an Aquarian way to be like, whatever, like, like that sucks for you. I'm a sweaty boo. But the Scorpio in me is like, oh my God, everything is so upset. You know, so it's that constant, you know, it's that constant internal battle and struggle. So yeah, my, my soul and or, God were like, we're going to make this interesting, this life. Or you going into full Scorpio mode with that tail. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, I was saying that, too. I was saying that to Emmy, like the bitch inside of me. When I get men that come into my class, I think, you know, yoga is so easy. I'm like, well, ha, ha, ha. Then that Scorpio moon comes and I beat their, I make it hard on them. But, um, uh -huh. but yeah. I with the with the with the tough being the tough love when you are the teacher, like I was telling Emmy, because the Ashtanga practice itself is so it's it's built. It's this beautiful mechanism that's built to like really piss you off. Like that's the point of the practice. It's a, it's built that way to make you mad. And I I, the, I was telling Emmy the hardest part for me as a teacher is when a student thinks that they're falling apart, but I know that they can do it. I see that open pathway, and I have to be the real stern one and say, "No, get up, get up, get up, reach backwards." You know, and to see them. But then once they break through that and they realized why I had to stonewall them a little bit. There's a realization there, but it's so it hard is. in that moment because the the Scorpio moon in me wants to sit on the mat and cry with them, you know, and yeah. have a pity party yeah. with them. And that's that's the hardest part. And I think that's why so many really good healers were put through the fire is because they came out the other side. And so they see where you are and they know how to respond to that in order to what's it, Krishmachari? One of his quotes was, you meet the student where they are, not where you are. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Beautifully put. Yeah. I was, I'm sorry. Say, you, you're saying as a teacher, you want to sit on the map and cry, uh, on the mat and cry. I want to sit and rationalize with them exactly why it's so good for them to be doing. <laughs> that's the Aquarian. Like, listen, here's the plan. <laughs> and of course, the Libra moon agrees completely in this instance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, those two, Libra and Aquarius together are terrible. They're like these terrible twins. I love my Libra buddies. And of course, my Gemini buddies and yep. my Sag buddies. We like have so much fun. The Sagas, I love the Sagittarians. Two of my really good friends, <laughs> Stephanie, our friend Stephanie, she's a Libra. And my friend Chris, who is a movement specialist in Canada, is a Libra. And it's just so fun. It's I, I with a well, Mornays and Aries, any time in my life where I'm about to get around it's always been with an Aries. Like for some reason, that fire of Aries and my air of Aquarian just. <laughs> no, <laughs> we get wild. We get wild. So. <laughs> uh, beautiful. So we know, Shanti, I know I think a lot of people, and again, I, I keep saying this, I keep reiterating this over and over and over again, because in the Western world, especially in the American world, I think sometimes we've been taught to view exercise as a way of punishment. And don't get me wrong. There are people who will abuse themselves with exercise. That is a form of bulimia where you binge eat 
and then just yeah. purge exercise. Um, yeah. But that is a different topic for a different day that we can talk about. But for this, I think so many people have it in their mind that exercise is supposed to be something you do to punish yourselves to, to fit into the skinny jeans. But we are coming at this. And I when I was a young kid, that's how I saw exercise. And it was through years and years of yoga where I realized that's not what exercise is for at all. It's yeah, a way to exactly. discover your body. It's a way to heal your body. It's a way to get in deep into the crevices of your physical body. But what happens too is soreness sometimes is energy shifting. So that that's very normal. And I wanted to express that to people yeah. like to be sore. Is, is, oh, you guys hear that? Sorry. I think my, I think Shanti might've frozen there. Hey, Shanti, can you hear me? Um. I'm back, honey. I think my internet went a little bit unstable, but hey, life in Africa, things are unstable, yeah, including okay. our internet. Well, you know what I also want? So I wanted to just say, yeah, if you if you get diarrhea, great, you're releasing your shit. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I wanna I wanna just talk about that as well, because <clears throat> with the minute we start doing any kind of a detox, and this is a detox, right? It's a 30-day face your shadow. So you're starting to exercise. You're obviously starting to watch what you eat. You're drinking more water. Yep. You look more conscious. So think about, let's talk about what happens within the body when you are abusing your body. I'm not talking about flagellation. Now. I'm just talking about through bad eating, non-exercise, stress in the body, anything like that. Okay. So as we then start breathing let's say by doing exercise or doing some yoga or whatever it is you're doing on your challenge eating more drinking more water you can imagine that the gunk it's like slimy snotty little gunkiness in the cells of your body like whoa, whoa, whoa. okay yeah. now it starts releasing and that's called the toxin so you are detoxing and, the, and, and, and you're going to detox physically. Many of you are going to detox within the first three days. Some of you are going to have a headache from hell. That's very common. Yeah. Yep. I want to suggest that should that happen to you, you just drink a lot of water. If you have to take a, we are, I mean, I call it a panada, it's a painkiller. It's the one. Ibuprofen, Advil, yeah. Yeah, you know, anything, take a, take a headache tablet or something or some type of thing if you really have to. Okay, some of you might have headaches for three days. If that is the case, drink a lot of water, breathe, just sit, do deep, slow breathing. Yes, maybe take something to help you with pain or something, but just be aware of what's happening. Push through it because the minute you push through that detox, and of course, your detox could be anything from headache, diarrhea, nausea, fever blisters pimples, rashes, um, anything like that, guys. It's very, it's very, very common. And it's usually like a 24-hour sort of like a flu virus. You might feel like you've got a whole detox thing going, snotty nose, cough. It'll often be like a 24-hour type flu virus thing that you get as well. Know that that's going to happen. It's your body clearing itself. So just drink lots of water. Acknowledge yourself. Thank yourself. Thank your body. Keep just being very cool to yourself through the process. That's, now, you know, we, many we, of us have done. Mm -hmm. My teacher in India gets excited. They call it the yoga fever. When you get like the 24-hour fever, they call it the yoga fever. Yeah. And they get excited because yeah. it means that it means something is working. Something unstuck itself. And so if we think about a compost pile, we burn away the compost. So your body is literally now being informed by your choices to start burning away old toxins, old patterns in order for the, it to be born anew. And so, yeah, and the, like, I'm very Vata, so I never had an issue with breaking out, never, my skin's very dry, but I know people in Ashtanga that will go through a period where they break out like a teenager again. And it's because it's because all the toxins are coming up and releasing from the, the body's able to now release. It's, it's moving, it's literally moving stuck energy. It's literally moving it out. Absolutely. And guys, and I never, I cannot express enough times how intelligent your body is. Your body is the most intelligent vehicle you'll ever possess, the most beautifully oh, precious gem you could ever wish for, right? It is your soul in physical form. 
It is your soul in meat suit, right? So because, let's say, spirit operates on 99 dimensions, which is infinity. So when we come to have our earthly experience, right, it's dimension? Three. Three. So think about going from this high vibrating and slowing down into ha, meat suit. <laughs> Beautiful meat suit, but very limiting. Yeah. And remember on earth, we are absolutely, we, we, we've come yet to forget. Yeah. So we forget who we are on earth because how would I remember who I am unless I forgot? Yeah. And that moment of remembering is the most beautiful, precious, exhilarating. And when I say orgasmic, please, I'm not equating that to anything sexual, but that moment of explosion of truth that is so blissful that there's not a doubt in your mind of what it is. That's all. It's just an amazing spiritual feeling and a spiritual resolution that can never be doubted. No. And it's so, as you were saying that, I was thinking about Sri Swami Satchitananda and his commentaries on the Yoga Sutras. He kind of speaks about this. And my, I've heard many Indian teachers say the highest level of um, spirituality is, is humor, is being able to have a sense of humor. And Sri Swami Satchitananda, I'm paraphrasing his commentary on the sutras where he talks about when you figure this out, when you have that Prativa moment, that flat that Sanskrit for a flash of illumination, that Prativa, all of a sudden you, you take life seriously, but you don't at the same time. And so you're in a position now to really enjoy the ride of life. Oh yeah. Because now oh, you yeah. know it's, that's all it is. It's just an, it's just a roller coaster ride. And when it's over, you could often go home. And so the and you have the tools. Yes. You've been around this block a few times, right? Mm -hmm. And you know now, you know, <clears throat> there is something, there was a thing on Facebook a while ago that, that I remember and I went, okay, if you could give your younger self advice, what would that be? And there's one thing I would tell myself, stop worrying. Yeah. Worry is the key to disaster. I have always been provided for. God has always provided for me. I have been in moments of such despair and boom, there it is. And I know that had I worried less and trusted more, my life would have been much easier and much more pleasant. So it's about trusting yourself, trusting that you're not walking alone. Trusting that you, by divine design, you and a say you in a sacred contract with God are here because of that. You would never be in a position that you should not be in, oh. no matter what that is. And the minute we realize that and we embrace that, it's like we shift gears and the truth arises and directs us. It's not even like something you and I got to try and do and clamor up. That's, you know, when we clamor up and are exhausted, it's we've been running on empty. You know, you run on empty when you deprive yourself of truth and energ energy and all these beautiful things. Yeah. When you align and in truth, it's like you're always being filled. Every second, you're just being filled with spirit, God, source, the Holy Ghost, Christ, whatever you want to call it, you know, to me, I don't, I'm not saying it's all these different things. It's one thing. One thing with many names. Different, yeah, that yeah. has different names. It yeah. is one thing with many names. And that's, that's so, because, you know, that's the one thing I would tell myself. And I see it on my channel time. Comparison is the thief of joy as well, because we're not here to, we learn from people, but to compare yourself to someone else, you're on your own, your unique journey. You know, and, and that's, that's, it's the, it's a thief of joy. If you're going to be comparing yourself to someone else's existence, then you're not living in your own. And yeah. so there's a joy that's a, a joy that's being stolen from you in that moment. And you're the one stealing it because you're comparing yourself to something outside of yourself. 
you know, exactly. and it's, um, it's funny too. I keep thinking about, you talk about the letting go thing. My teacher in India once talked, and I've, I've mentioned this before. A friend of mine was having an issue with his divorce. He's going through a divorce. His wife left him. He was having some issues. And so he went to go commiserate with our teacher. And my teacher in India is really good about not telling you what to do. He just talks to you in metaphors and you figure it out. And he, he said that Sharat said that it's like trying to hold on to sand. So sometimes when we hold on to things that want to go or that are toxic, the sand's going to fall through your fingers anyway. It's going to slowly start to fall out anyway. In the meantime, you're squeezing so hard, you're bruising your palm. But if you just let it go, because it's going to go anyway, exactly. freedom that exists there. And, yeah, that liberation, that liberation. And I want to express too, because I know I keep telling this to people, when it comes to the exercise, I want people to let go of any expectations mm. that the bar is going to be easy or the yoga is going to be easy or expectations that something's going to be too hard. Through this practice, can you greet each morning's exercise with just interest? Like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder what I get to do today. What's going to happen instead of expecting something? Because reality and expectation are two different things. And one thing we learned too is not to have, uh, we try not to have judgment. We try to just observe instead of have opinions on something yes, that, that hasn't even happened too. Because that's another, that's also a comparison being the thief of joy again, you know? Yes. And, um, and, um, and I don't know if we, we, we spoke about this too. Um, some people were talking about, and Catherine and I spoke about this, you know, maybe we've already mentioned this. If so, let me know. But, um, We've been talking a lot about this journey about the hard stuff coming up because that's the most shocking because pain is real. It's the most shocking. It's the, when that uncomfortable anger comes up, that's where we want to run and, and quit. Mm -hmm. um, but some people, Shanti, they're not going to experience that right away, are they? No. Your emotions, you see, your emotions are stored in the cells of your body. And you can imagine energetically the cells in your body look like little onions, Okay. And there are many, many layers until you get to the core. And remember, the core is the oldest, the deepest, the most hidden, the one that you most want to not get in touch with, if that yeah. makes sense. So very often, we start working on the outer layers of what, let's say, our issues might be. So you might immediately start getting stuck. You see, what often happens, and I'll tell you what I find, what I found over the years, is that originally, let's say initially they started, people start on a high, wow, so maybe the first week, three days, and maybe the first two weeks you find, and then suddenly one morning you wake up and you feel like crap. Yep. Guys, girls, this is going to happen. And when that day arises, and it will, welcome it. Welcome the shitty day that's coming because you've got to know that's the oh, stuff that's been hiding in you that has been the glue that has held you back from moving forward. You're becoming so what you, Yeah, what you want to do on those days is you want to, A, be very gentle with yourself. No, um, I am here to tell you, you're going to have them probably more than once. And I'm here to remind you that when you do, just take a breath, embrace yourself. No, it's the stuff that you don't like coming to the surface and to give you an opportunity to alchemize or transmute it. That's, what, that's an opportunity. Your shitty feelings are opportunities, okay? We're alchemy. We turn the lead into gold. So the lead is saying, Mama, I'm here. Show me what I need to see. And right. the only <laughs> thing that, is, that, is gonna, that, you, that you need to give yourself then is love. Yeah. So breathe. Do a gentle yoga practice that morning. Or if all you want to do is lie in Shavasana on your mat and breathe or lie in child's pose and breathe. That's what you do. Breathing is the most important thing you will ever, ever, ever do. Um, and yeah. 
Yeah, we're going to get deeper into water. that later on because that's very confusing for people in the beginning with breath work. And we're going to get deeper into that because yeah, I told the story yesterday of uh, the Ramayana with, um, you know, I'll recap it quickly where Hanuman is hired by Ram to go find Sita because Sita, Ram's wife, has been kidnapped by Ravana, the tin-headed demon. And so Hanuman, again, is the monkey god. His father is Vayu, which is the wind or the breath. And Hanuman, like us, goes through these places where he forgets that he has these powers. But in the process of finding Sita, he remembers, he has this memory of who he is and the power he's able to jump from India all the way to Sri Lanka. And he has to fight the 10 headed demon Ravana, the, de the beast who can't be slain to return Sita back to Ram. And he does, he beats, defeats Ra uh, uh, Ravana, which you can read the Ramayana, Ramayana to see how he does that. He returns Sita to Ram. Well, this whole story, as in most of the Hindu mythology is that it's 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 a metaphor ram is god sita is your soul ravana is your ego and hanuman is your bravery and courage through the breath you have the courage to breathe into that battle that you're facing because the, the person you're battling on your yoga mat or are in your kickboxing class isn't your father isn't your ex-boyfriend isn't your okay. sibling it's you it's Ravana. It's your ego. And that, and that is in those moments, it's so important to realize this is when we talk about the mirror or the shadow work. Okay, this is the shadow. Shadow really means that it's the, the, those parts of yourself that you haven't gotten to know yet, so you might be a little bit scared of them, or those parts of yourself that you think you don't like. Now, Think about a child, okay, who's gotten ignored and had no attention. That child is going to go and seek negative attention. We all know that. Now, think about your own personality doing that as well. Those parts of yourself you've denied, not liked, not understood, so you've shoved them away because others have told you that it's not good enough or not pretty enough or not clever enough or whatever, so you hide away and try and become something else. We all do that. No one is immune from that, right? So basically then what you want to be doing is through this whole process of getting to know bit by bit, stage by stage, sitting with yourself, sitting with yourself in those moments, writing. A journal is so important right now. To That's write. part of our challenge is they have to have questions, yes. questions every day. Yeah. To write because that's, and not typing guys, write, scribing, because the energy flows through the arm and into the pen and the words shaped have their own frequency and vibration. So it's really about understanding what that is about. And, you know, this is such an incredible journey because all these surfacing emotions are there to show you something about yourself. Sit with yourself. Any child that is ignored, give, that's the negative attention. So now sit with yourself. I uh, like Alga. What's up, Shanti? You're looking shitty this morning. Uh -huh. Why are you feeling bad? Ah. Ah. Mm. Then I'll sit and I go, okay, there in the body. And I'll say it's feeling in my belly. What happened yesterday that surfaced at night? And then I'll go through my day and ah, there's the glitch. And then I'll go, okay, that conversation with someone or that situation has really perturbed me. I need to go there and see what it's brought up for me. And then I go, okay, mm, okay, okay. And then, and then immediately I'll take it to other emotions that, other experiences that had a similar or the same emotion, you're always going to find the emotion is the common thread. The experiences or the manifestations are going to be different, but the common thread will remain the same. And then you find it back to your own fears. And you see how your own fears have created so many negative manifestations of situations in your life. Yeah. Then you go back. And it's like uprooting uh, and, uh, you know, they call it the sankaras of the mind. I don't know what they call it in your lineage, which is like the root. So yeah. you can't 
to try and get rid of a, a, a bad weed, you don't mow it. It's like mowing the lawn. It's going to grow within a few days. What you unroot it. So it's like the Sankaras, in other words, uprooting what they call the miseries of the mind. Mm -hmm. Because the mind is what causes the miseries, bad thinking. Yeah. Bad thinking is what causes a bad life. So then you start replanting, recycling, right? And you start then infusing your mind and your thoughts. You start planting seeds. I mean, I remember in India, our tuk-tuk driver says, well, you know, you can't pretty much, uh, the neem being the very, very, probably the most bitter fruit uh, in the world, but in India. <laughs> and he says, you can't plant a neem seed and expect to grow sweet golden mangoes, you see. Uh, I mean, how you can't plant a neem seed, which is the bitter, bitter, bitter fruit, and expect to harvest mangoes. Yeah. You need to plant the mango seed to get, the sweet golden mangoes, right? So when we understand what we're putting in is what we're getting out, it's that simple. And for us to then realize we have the ability to, uh, to dissolve, to uproot the miseries of the mind just by observing our thoughts, by observing our actions, by observing our reactions to things. We can change a lot. And journaling is an amazing thing. So to sit with yourself when these emotions come up, yeah. have a bath, put some nice, I don't know, nice um, smelly oil, you know. Actually, that's part of the challenge every night yeah. is to take a hot Epsom salt bath before bed to relax into it. <laughs> and all of the journal questions I ask you guys are just prompting you. Like, I, I think pe most people know that some of the questions, some people have never journaled. And so I ask some questions just to get you going. So you don't have to stick to the template. The questions are there just to kind of push the domino over so that you can figure out what you want to say. Exactly. And one of the exactly. challenges later on is you actually have to write a letter to your child, to you as a little girl or a little boy. I already did that. It must have been, I can't remember when. But it was the best exercise I ever did, honestly. And I'm going to do it again because I wrote a letter to little me. I, I said, hello, mini me. <laughs> and I saw myself, and I saw myself exactly the way I was as a child. I was smart. I was curious. I was always wanting to know what was going on. And I was a pain in people's ass, you know? And I couldn't understand why my good intentions or my asking questions elicited such a negative response from adults. I could never understand that. I really couldn't. But I soon turned around and became very pissed off with everyone. I did not like my siblings. Um, they always teased me, I, and I reacted to them. Um, I decided it was much easier just to hang out with myself. Mm -hmm. And I did. And then, they, of course, I had my animal friends and my talking to me. And who the hell needed anyone else giving you nonsense when you have this whole world of nature just being as beautiful as what it is, right? <laughs> so, yeah. It's such an Aquarian I mean, thing to do, too. Uh, it's such, I was laughing because God gave you, you, or you, your soul gave you that because an Aquarian would be like, screw you guys, I'm going home. And I'm like, well, we're not yeah, like, ourselves. I know? packed my picnic basket. I'm four or five years old. I packed my picnic basket and I, run, I walk across to the other side of the farm. You don't understand. I mean, it's like far. I don't know how far it is. I got to walk through the paddock with all the little young bulls and things, and I love them. And my father never said, my father always said, you can't walk in there. You got to walk on the other side of the fence. I'm going, screw you. I'm walking here. Yeah? And there I am, and they were after me. And, you know, we like playing, we're hanging out, you know, like it's so much, it was so much more fun than having my siblings giving me nonsense in my ears. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's what I will say. So I said this on Aquarius Rising Africa, their uh, Shanti's channel, I think it was yesterday. And I'll say it again here. 
For the non-Americans, we have the Americans have Thanksgiving coming up on November 24th, which is a big holiday here. And so I factored in the holiday into the challenge. And I showed you how to be flexible with yourself, making your exercise and journaling a priority, perhaps getting a little earlier so you can work on yourself before having to be with family. <laughs> and say in the journal for our non-American friends, observe your American friends in this situation. Because in a month from now, we all got Christmas. And as Ram Dass says, Ram Dass would say this, you think you're so enlightened. If you really think you are so enlightened, go spend a week with your family. Because those are the biggest karmic relationships you will ever have. No one will totally. off like your, your family will. And siblings are even more special because it's like, what did someone say? Like with your siblings, you won't let them have your borrow your phone charger, but you would give them a kidney. Like that's okay. that dynamic with your siblings. You can't have my phone charger. You'll lose it, but I'll give you my kidney. You know, <laughs> you know, like, um, like when my, I love my, my sister is, I love my sister so much. And she's very laid back person. She's a B negative blood type. She's totally just chill. She's great mom. But when she had my nephew, my, her oldest child, Charlie would come visit and stay with it, hang out with aunt Bryce for a little while. And this is when he was in diapers and he loved raisins. And so me being the spiteful sister, I would always give my nephew raisins as a treat right before he went home because raisins make people poop. And so he would get home and have these like blowout diapers. And my sister would call me and be like, you got to stop giving him raisins. And I'd be like, Dee! <laughs> 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 like, hang the phone on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your sister. <laughs> my sister. I know what I'm doing. I gave that kid raisins right before I sent him home. So, <laughs> um, so, so that's the beauty of the, those relationships. Like, you know, as much as our siblings give us that friction and that tension, they're also are like our family. And I think about that yeah. as our parents get old, as my parents get older, like I'm so glad I have my sister, you know, to help with these big life situations that we all go through with our siblings have to go through it with us, you know, and that, that there's yeah. any, and nobody understands you and your circumstances like the person that grew up with you. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's a very interesting relationship. And so I have put that into the challenge. So if you guys who are non-Americans, if you skip to November 24th, you'll see what I wrote out. And hopefully I even say like, you know, use this as a preparation for Christmas be, or whatever next holiday is coming for you because you don't want to just totally, you know, that sometimes we do have to remove people from our lives because of toxicity. I get that. We, 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 we lovingly remove ourselves. But on this path, you don't want to completely isolate yourself from everyone. You need to learn how to work within the realms of your world, if that makes sense. And like, I'm the black sheep of my family. You know, my grandmother, my dad's mother, before she passed away, she was my saving grace because she would hide books on reincarnation under the bed for my grandfather. So she was the one that was, she tried to teach me to meditate when I was eight. You know, she was kind of that. So I had that, but now that she's gone, I'm the oddball, you know? And so you have to learn how to work within the realms because you've been given this family for a reason there's agreements that were made for each of you to grow wherever you're supposed to grow and so and if, if all else fails just laugh and know that that's your biggest test is going home for christmas you know so um and especially now if you're in a family where half of the people see what's going on in the world and the other half don't you know Absolutely. collectively we're in a huge pressure cooker right now so we can either be like this sucks or this is really interesting and fantastic and let's see what happens tomorrow you know so um so anyway but i know we're about over an hour now you guys uh, we didn't even get to the sound bowl healing i'm gonna be linking shanti's uh last episode with sound bowl healing in the description box below because on saturday you guys are going to start to explore sound bowl healing and shanti aquarius rising africa and solutions by aquarius rising africa are participating channels in this challenge and shanti i'm going to put you on the spot here i think i've done this to a few times in january i'm contemplating doing a 60-day challenge and having you guys help contribute to certain weeks oh yeah not Have 30 days 60 days. 60 days. Yeah. That's so one. This is just the warm up. 
I like it. I like it. <laughs> so you guys um, definitely check out Aquarius Rising Africa Solutions by Aquarius Rising Africa or with Aquarius Rising Africa. Again, sound bowl healing is coming up this weekend as well as studying the doshas, which is something Shanti and I have talked about a lot. And I, I've had a lot of people ask me, oh, where's a good test to take? Where's a good text to take? And I really sat back and I thought about it. Here's the thing about this energy work with the doshas. When you study each individual dosha and you really get familiar with it, what they represent, you don't need to take a test because you'll start to see it. Exactly. And that's it's what I, I don't want you guys taking a test. I want you just to study them for yourselves. Read about each Pitta Kappa um, Vata. <laughs> study yeah. the times of days that are incorporated with these energy cycles and, and, and start to understand it for yourself so you can take that power back. That's I, uh, Next week, we also have food journaling coming up next week. And um, all I'm having you guys do is write down everything that you eat. And then 30 to 45 minutes to an hour after you eat, I want you to write down how you feel. And this is not, we're not talking about just whether you feel bloated or gassy or diarrhea or feel great. I'm talking about, are you depressed? Do you have anxiety? Because food also does that. Sometimes your reaction to food isn't just your stomach, but your emotions. And so you guys are going to start to just experiment with yourself and to see your relationship with food and what certain foods are causing certain reactions so that it's going to be different for different people so that you have that power to start making those decisions to better harness your body. 100%. And I can't wait to see how everybody does with that because it's so exciting. It's so when, when I, as a teacher, when I see people start to get it, I'm like, yay. <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> It's amazing, <laughs> that light bulb moment, you know, and people start seeing the results and they start feeling different and you just wake up and suddenly things start changing. Your relationships start changing. It's just a beautiful time. Yeah. God bless you all guys. And thank you for joining us on this journey. Yeah. Thank yourself for being so courageous and so brave and for taking the step forward. Really, it's a beautiful time for us all. This is how we connect with our tribes, right? Yep. From all over the world. Absolutely. We are the storm. You are yeah. lightning in a bottle. You are the storm. All right, guys, we love you very much, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.